Hello, Tiffany. So good to have you here today. Thank you, Heather. It's wonderful to be a guest on your podcast. (laughs) Well, I'm excited to have Tiffany Loeffler here because she is the executive director of the Alliance, and it's been fun to watch her in action because I'm actually a board member with Tiffany, and I've been on the board for a couple of years now, and we meet quarterly, and let me just say, every time I show up at my quarterly event, I'm like, how much did you get done? So she's a mover and a shaker. She's been so fun to work with and serve on the board, and I'm really excited about my role on the board, but also just supporting such a wonderful, capable leader, and that's why I wanted to bring you on our show today, Tiffany. So I'm just going to hand it over to you. Tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do. Thank you. Um, Well, as you mentioned, I am the founder and executive director of the Alliance. Um, I'm an adoptive mom. So I've been married to my best friend for the last 16 years. We just celebrated our anniversary recently. Mm. And uh, my two kids are adopted from Haiti. Uh, We Mm. did an international adoption that took almost seven years to complete, but they Mm. came home in 2017. And so now I have a 16 year old and an 18 year old at home. So we kind of jumped into like the older spectrum of kids. Um, But I grew up in an awesome, loving family, always Mm. knowing that I was um, cared for and that I could accomplish anything in life. My parents did a great job of championing um, me. And so I really was heartbroken when I found out that other kids didn't have that. Mm. And so um, I've led missions teams globally. I've led church-based ministry locally, but Mm. uh, really six and a half, seven years ago, felt like there needed to be more of a cohesive movement around at-risk youth, foster youth, families in crisis. And so that's what the Alliance does. We actually gather together all the agencies, nonprofits, and community service groups in the greater Sacramento area where we're located um, Mm. that are working with this population, helping them work together, and then inviting the community to all do something to help the kids and families here in our region. So Mm. love that. What I love about your nonprofit model is there's no competition. Right. And there's a bringing together and a building of bridges and even the sharing of resources. So that's what made me excited about being on this board and going after these at risk communities and the people who support these at risk communities. That to me was just a really exciting proposition. And to see it happen in our own backyard, it's been really fun to be a part of. I want to ask you this because we're going to pivot over a little bit to leadership and yes. what it looks like for you leading. And you know my tagline, 3C living and leading, clarity, confidence, and courage. Tell me a little bit about how that has supported your direction and leadership. Absolutely. Well, as I was processing through those three things <laughs> and reading your book, was um, it just felt like an outline for life. Um, It was an outline for how to do relationships, how to do work, how to do community service, because Mm -hmm. it just brings everything together. And so I just I really appreciated the amount of understanding of how we show up. I feel like our lives are really chaotic. I mean, Mm -hmm. if if we all think about it, our inboxes are full. We're getting so many text messages. Mm -hmm. We're bombarded by the chaos of our communities. Mm -hmm. And so scaling things back almost like the two steps back so that you can see what's really important. I feel like those three things really identify, we all, we all need clarity of who we are as people. What are we doing in our workplace? What are we doing in our community? How, how do we want to be showing up for our family and clarity? And then the courage and confidence is really stepping into those spaces where we have clarity. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I think it, it, it plays itself out in so many different ways for me. Um, both at work and at home, but it allows me to show up at the be- as the best version of myself, whether I'm in a staff meeting leading a, my, my team or whether I'm showing up at home at the end of the day and giving my very best to my family and not just mm. the leftovers. So I love it. Well, you are a mover and a shaker. That's how I got to introduce you. And I am as well. And sometimes we could be dangerous together. <laughs> but, um, you know, I open the book with clarity the very first chapter is restorative rest and it's really a permission slip. You sign at the end of the chapter to say, I give myself permission to rest because it's so critical for clarity. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about how rest has increased your clarity and what you do to rest? 
Absolutely. Um, I really try to set aside um, really healthy work and home boundaries. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still growing in that area. I feel like there's always more we could do because, again, there's always more coming at us. But mm-hmm. um, as a leader, there is no ending of opportunities, right? Mm-hmm. There's no ending of things that we could be doing to invest in our team or invest in our organizations or to build up a, a business. If mm-hmm. you are in the business sector, there's just constant opportunities out there. Mm-hmm. And so I do believe that resting first so that we give our bodies and our minds time to slow down enough Mm -hmm. to process and prioritize. Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't mention this, but I'm also in healthcare. I've been a physical therapist for 16 years. And so that's the, that's the industry I came out of before Mm -hmm. stepping into the nonprofit space. And in healthcare, we use the word triage often. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're going into the ER, if you're going and being seen by your doctor, they're going to triage your symptoms. They're going to triage what you're presenting with because they need to know what's the most urgent and important. Mm -hmm. And they're going to address that first. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like if we could look at rest as like number one on the triage list, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we could say, hey, if we can slow down and say, what does my week look like? What does my Mm -hmm. month look like? Some of the ways that we do that practically here at our nonprofit is that we take, we have a good chunk of time each week set aside for a staff meeting Mm -hmm. and people are sharing what they're working on and have the opportunity to ask questions. Mm -hmm. So if they're needing clarity, I have seven people on my team and we have a a wealth of resources and knowledge and experience. Mm But the person carrying out a certain task or program might not have all of it themselves. And Mm -hmm. so having that time set aside for Mm -hmm. those check-ins is really Mm -hmm. vital for our team. We also get away for a staff retreat once a year. And that Mm -hmm. is a two-day time where the first day Mm -hmm. is just connecting with each other as a team. We mm-hmm. don't talk work at all. We don't talk calendars for the next year or budgets. We actually just say, let's play some games together. Let's share what's on our hearts together. Let's talk about our families, mm-hmm. the things that are our values and the things that are important to us. And then let's have fun. And so mm-hmm. we share good food and we have a great time. The next day we come back and say, okay, now that we're feeling more connected as a team, what are we going to do to tackle the, the challenges in our community to meet the needs of more kids and families in the year to come? Mm, I'd love that. I love also, that. one mm-hmm. more thing, I have all of my staff members get a paid personal day. Mm-hmm. And I let them know right off the bat, it's in their employee handbook that that's, that's an annual thing. You get a paid day once a year to step away from work, but get fully paid. And it's not to go on a vacation. It's not to, you know, pick mm-hmm. your kids up from school. It's actually to do whatever your soul needs to be filled up. Mm -hmm. So it's your job to assess, is that going on a hike? Is that sitting at a coffee shop and reading? Is that journaling? What is that for you? And that's what you spend your day doing. And by the end Mm -hmm. of the year, you have to have taken that day and tell me about it. So I love it. How many days do they get? Did you say? They just get one. One, but still you're just holding that, that accountability and that value there. So do you do it as well? Yes. Okay. And what do you do? I, I try to do a conglomerate of things. I'm a big mm-hmm. reader. So mm-hmm. reading is always part of my agenda. I try and read like two or three books at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm reading something that's teaching me something. And then I read something that's a fantastic story. And then mm-hmm. I usually read something that's inspirational. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll sit at a Starbucks and I will read. I will um I enjoy bargain hunting. So I usually go out and do a little bit of bargain hunting. I do it around my birthday each year. So I take my birthday money and I get to do a little bit of retail therapy. Um, And then I try and get out in nature because that's just fueling for my soul. Oh, I hear you. I hear you on all of those accounts. That sounds like my perfect day as well. (laughs) Awesome. It sounds like my perfect week, actually. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes, that would be great. Yeah. For larger corporations, we're a small nonprofit, so we can afford one day of yes. personal day for those larger companies. Sure. It yes. could be a week. <laughs> I hear Soul you. care week. We all yes. could use that. Soul care week is right, man. Well, I want to pivot over to your clarity of mission. I think that's something I've really loved watching you work. And I thought it was always fascinating. I mean, I tried to get into you as a PT and you were booked. So I knew you were (laughs) successful. It wasn't like you weren't successful in the field. And so then you went and started a nonprofit. (laughs) It it made me uh, ask the question as another businesswoman saying, what made you want to leave that field? I mean, what was that clarity of mission that you had to not only leave that field, open a nonprofit, but even more significantly, uh, adopt two Haitian children as your own? I just 
man, talk about being all in, Tiffany. Tell us a little bit of how that journey <laughs> went and how you got your clarity around that. Absolutely. Well, I feel like the clarity that I have is usually surrounded around problems, right? Mm. Um, I feel like the when we try to solve problems, we're bringing our best to the table. So the mm. two main problems that I kept seeing over and over again when I was helping local and global um, at-risk youth were there's a lot of really great organizations here in our region that are doing amazing things Mm. Um, from foster agencies to mentoring organizations to groups that are serving homeless families to single parents. Mm. Um, It's this great continuum of at-risk youth and families Mm. in crisis. So Mm -hmm. I could kind of see from the 35,000 foot view, this was all a huge continuum. And there's probably more than 200 nonprofits Mm. and agencies right here in our region that are doing great things. Mm -hmm. The challenge was those organizations either had no idea what each other were doing, or there was actually some direct competition in Mm. the nonprofit sector. Mm. We kind of expect that businesses will compete for your, for your market share. Mm -hmm. Um, They're going to be advertising. They're going to be trying to get people and customers to come in their doors, but the nonprofit sector can actually be very competitive too, because every nonprofit usually needs two things. They need volunteers and they Mm -hmm. need donors. Mm -hmm. They need the people and the funds to make their mission work. And so Mm -hmm. I was seeing a lot of disjointed efforts that I felt like all fit together in like the thousand piece puzzle. And if we just put the puzzle pieces together, shared ideas, shared resources, Mm recognize that we were actually all on the same team and not in competition with each other, we could see all the gaps in the system met. we could have a better picture of what resources were available, and we could serve even more kids and families. So that Mm -hmm. was some of the clarity. The other challenge I saw is that people in the community didn't know how to engage. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is called to adopt two kids from Haiti. Most people aren't. (laughs) Not everybody is called to be a foster foster parent. Most yes. people aren't. Those yes. are absolutely needed things, mm-hmm. so, but that that takes a big ask yeah. and an available home and lots of other um, support systems in right. place. So one of the other things that in clarity that I love is just getting to enlighten people on what the needs are mm-hmm. and what are some easy, tangible ways they can meet needs. Mm-hmm. Because it's honestly, we can assume people don't care, but it's really that people just don't know. Mm-hmm. They don't know what the need is or they don't know how they fit into the equation. So the Alliance mm-hmm. does a lot of that. We do community mobilization all year long mm-hmm. um, saying, hey, here's there's a need for mentors in our community. Do you have one hour a week to mentor a youth or a teen? Mm-hmm. Or, hey, there's a huge need for um, respite parents to get a night off. Could you mm-hmm. offer babysitting or could you put on a cohesive respite event? Um, and so there's just... A lot of times people just need to be invited in and feel like they have Mm. their place. And that's the beauty of clarity. That's the gift that it gives Mm. um, to people who are sitting on the bench or sitting out in the community Mm -hmm. and didn't know they were even needed. I have an actual example of that. It's so funny (laughs) you'd mention that because as you're talking, I was like, hmm, that's exactly what happened with my small group. Okay. Where every year in our neighborhood, we have a small group that we all get together. We have a blast. I've got wonderful neighbors. And the leader of the small group said, I don't want to bring Christmas gifts anymore. We all have enough gifts. Me being a board member, seeing an opportunity <laughs> moment, I stepped in and yes. said, hey, I'm a part of a this whole nonprofit that is really supporting our at-risk youth and our foster care and our caregivers and just... They had no concept of it, but once I exposed them to it, they got so excited about it, made donations, bought gifts, and they brought that to the Christmas party versus a gift for each other. And the whole thing shifted. And so when the invitations went out, that great little flyer you gave me, the card of all the options, I said, well, here, stick that in the the invitation. And people were excited about this idea of there's something that's out there. But to your point, the clarity around how to get involved, options around how to get involved, and giving people the respect of saying, I want to get involved, but this what this is what excites me and this isn't what excites me. I thought was really a great way to do that. Awesome. Yeah, it's been really fun. So that that uh, Christmas giving campaign that you mentioned that your mm-hmm. small group's getting involved in, mm-hmm. that was, we got to blast that out to the entire community. 
Mm-hmm. And so that Be a Difference Maker went out through 20 local churches. It went out through tons of different cohorts of like people. It went out through businesses. We have collection sites at restaurants and at real estate agencies. Um, and there's tons of different toy drives. Like there's so many ways people can get involved. All of the items from that are coming into our office. And so mm-hmm. because it was a collect- collective effort, Mm-hmm. And because there was clarity on around what the need was and what the ask was, um, we're right now and we're still bringing things in, but we're mm-hmm. going to be distributing 2000 toys to kids and families, mm-hmm. um, over $5,000 in grocery gift cards for families who have food mm-hmm. insecurity mm-hmm. and over 40 families are going to receive baskets that are completely filled, um, with all these beautiful gifts from holiday baking things to Christmas morning gifts. Um, mm-hmm. those are going to go to so many different families. And so it's just beautiful to see that ability for people to say yes, when they know what they're saying yes to. Oh, well said. Yeah. Yes. When they know what they're saying yes to. Oh, that's great. So you're giving, you have clarity of your own mission and you're giving clarity to other people to join you in your mission. I love that. Yep. I want to, I want to ask you a little bit about confidence and courage because as I know, starting something takes a tremendous amount of confidence and a tremendous amount of courage. You have those up days, those down days, and everything in between. It's Mm -hmm. a bit of a roller coaster because you're pioneering and blazing new, new trails. Right. Talk to us a little bit about that and how you how you handled some of those hard days and some of the insecurity and, and some of the confidence uh, practices you did to make sure that you stayed on point and actually started a really successful nonprofit. Yeah, that those two go so hand in hand for me, the, the mm-hmm. confidence and the courage, because I feel like I am well qualified to be a physical therapist. That Mm -hmm. was my educational background in undergraduate. I hold a doctorate degree. I had been in the field at that, at the time I launched the Alliance for over 10 years. So over a decade, Um, I was well qualified to be in healthcare Mm -hmm. Um, as I was building more clarity around both the problem and some of the potential solutions to help at-risk kids and families. I felt like I wanted to attach myself to either an existing organization Mm -hmm. or help mobilize more people to go and do this other task. It Mm -hmm. it, it kept coming back around to no, I needed to start it. I needed to lead it. Um, But that was definitely a confident shaker. Mm -hmm. I like to be um, qualified and prepared. I like to have all the answers. I'm a Mm -hmm. type A firstborn. (laughs) Um, And so it was like, oh, okay, I need to assess this from no one else is in this space. There's not a handbook on how to launch an alliance because mm-hmm. there wasn't one locally that served this vulnerable youth population. Mm-hmm. Um, some of it was learning from others. So there are a couple other regional alliances nationally. And mm-hmm. so getting on the phone or you know emailing with other people who are in this sector who I could learn from. Mm -hmm. the vision I had was slightly different than each one of those. And so it did take courage to push past the, but Mm -hmm. nobody's done it this Mm -hmm. way to still go ahead and start it. Mm -hmm. Um, I also really had to push past not feeling qualified for all of the different things that you need to do to start Mm -hmm. a nonprofit and to really ask for help. So I had a fantastic friend who's an attorney who set up Mm -hmm. all of our 501c3 nonprofit paperwork. And then I had other friends who were in finance who could make Mm -hmm. sure our books were set up correctly. So it was asking and inviting people in using the strengths that they carry Mm -hmm. and then also feeling like they had purpose mm-hmm. in building what I was building. So as we started the Alliance, even though I'm the founder, I was having vision casting meetings for about a year mm-hmm. with local leaders. Um, and the meetings ranged from one-on-one coffee meetings to like 50 people in a room. And we were using whiteboards to say, what would it look like to see a collaborative movement launch in our region? What would you need? Um, mm-hmm. Who could get involved? How would it be funded? How do we reduce competition, even in the area of fundraising mm-hmm. and increase collaboration? And so it's really kind of tapping the people that you know might care about the things that you care about and Mm. then leveraging their abilities and their acumen to, to really kind of launch into whatever is next. Mm. Oh, I love that. I love that. What did you do on your days when your confidence was shaken? Those are, those are tough days. Yeah, Um, they are. (laughs) <laughs> they are days. I do have an inbox folder that says encouragement and I have another uh, inbox folder that's success stories. Uh, so I can open those. So when people send me an email back that says 
hey, I love what you're doing and, mm. and thank you for stepping in. I save that in a folder because I need to mm. go back at those moments um, when we are meeting needs or when we're mm. launching a new trauma-informed education course mm. or when we are um, doing a holiday campaign. I want to save mm. data on that because I'm both feelings and thinker. Mm. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a combo deal. Yeah. And so I want statistics. I want to know that we're making an impact. And I yeah. also want to know that uh, what we do matters. Mm-hmm. And Honestly, we none of us get enough of that. Mm-hmm. Um, spe- like in the business sector to the nonprofit sector, mm-hmm. people you're not always having them come back and say thank you mm-hmm. or what a what an amazing service you provide or what mm-hmm. an amazing organization you lead. Mm-hmm. So when you do get those, um, and they again are few and far between, saving them up. As a staff, we also do um, at our Christmas party and on your birthday. Um, everybody, it's like the opposite of a roast. They write Mm. all the things that they appreciate about you. um, And you can actually, like, I have a little jar um, of all the great things my staff thinks about me um, Mm. because we all did that for each other. And so it's in the jar. So you can also pull a little piece of paper out of a jar if you're having a tough day. Oh, I love that. Oh, I think everyone should have that in the workplace. (laughs) Yes. Um, Confidence has to do with beliefs. What are some false beliefs you've had to reject and what are some true beliefs you're having to bite in? Yeah, I, well, like I said, I, I grew up in a family who was really, my parents were great at saying, you can do whatever you put your heart at heart Mm -hmm. to. Um, And so I had some of the foundation of being able to operate in that, that field of courage and, and confidence. I think the areas that I have to, the false beliefs I would have to say is, I have to do everything. Mm. Um, That's a big one, especially when you're the founder of something because you Mm -hmm. wear so many different hats. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to say, okay, I'm not the expert, but maybe I still have to get the job done. Mm -hmm. Or I am going, this is important for our organization, but I'm going to wait for the right person to come along to carry the torch on that Mm -hmm. because I want it done well. We're an organization that that wants to operate in excellence in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't have somebody on my team or if I don't carry a strength myself, Mm -hmm. it that that thing that we might need to do might sit on a shelf for a little bit Mm -hmm. until the right person steps into that role. So some Mm -hmm. I've been learning delegation skills. I've been Mm -hmm. learning when to say no. No, our no is powerful. Yes. Um, because the things that we say no to give us room to say yes to the right things. Mm -hmm. So that has been like at first, I can tell you, like when you, when you're starting a nonprofit and somebody invites you to come speak or come share, you say yes to everything. Right. I'm, like nights yeah. and weekends, and I was like, "Where's my Where's my time gone?" Yeah. And then you recognize that when I mean, some of those turned out to be wonderful and very helpful events or helpful groups to speak to, others you're like, "There was not a whole lot of fruit in that." I think I just gave up a whole evening away from my family, and it wasn't the best use of my time. Yeah. And so living in that space of being okay saying no or being okay and saying not yet Mm -hmm. um, has been really helpful. I love that. Either saying no or not yet. I think that's a really good distinction to make. I had a friend who used to say to me, Heather, no is a complete sentence. And I thought, you know, my people pleasing side wants to say, well, maybe, or (laughs) this is semi no, or, or saying yes, but you can feel down your gut. You're supposed to say no. (laughs) Oh, there's been, yeah. And all of us have those things. And there are things that we still have to do. Like there's things for our kids or spouses or the things that we have to say yes to, even though it's like, oh, I know that's going to drain my energy a little bit. Yes. But yeah, when it comes to work, like living in that sweet spot and doing the things that you are gifted at, um, or setting aside time and, and dedicating time on your schedule where you have a lot of tenacity yeah. and you just get done all the things that you know you have to do, but it just doesn't bring you a whole lot of uh, joy. Yes. Yes. I hear you. You know, as you talked about the healthcare field and moving into nonprofit, you're nonprofit full-time now, right? I still treat patients one day a week. So okay. it's just a very limited schedule, but I, yeah, my, my physical therapy part of me is just so, I, I love it so much and it really allows me to help others. I, I love getting to help people, whether it's here uh, at the Alliance or whether it's in my clinic. Oh, 
What have you learned about yourself as you've moved away from your career that you trained for? You have a doctorate in that and very successful in that field. It sounds like there was just a, a pull on your heart, a tug on your heart to take on really a very uncomfortable <laughs> project. You had you had it all go and it was great. Yeah. It sounds like there was something that was really pulling on you. And I'm noticing just the satisfaction and fulfillment. But talk to us a little bit about that journey and how you knew that you needed to step away from that and move into something completely new and different. Yeah, I I really believe every kid should grow up in a safe, loving family. I mm. think that's been foundational in how I was brought up and foundational in how I want my life to be led, lived mm. out. I feel like we all get to leave a legacy. Um, personally, I have a faith journey that says like, hey, I've been adopted um, and mm. I want to give that to others. Um, but I also feel like there's just something beautiful about the relationships. Families are a place where we're supposed to be ourselves. Um, mm. That's where we learn vulnerability. That's mm. where we learn how to take risks. That's where our, our identity is developed. Um, mm. There's a lot of hard parts of our culture today that aren't addressed because people aren't in longstanding relationships. Mm. We haven't learned the value or we haven't retained the value of longevity. Mm -hmm. um, in our culture today, because, Hey, we're upgrading our cell phone every year. We're getting a new computer every two years. We're getting mm -hmm. our lease on our cars expires every three. Like we're used to things changing and being disposable, but people aren't. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like when I'm investing in people and relationships and stability, mm -hmm. that when that happens, when that gift is given to a child, uh, mm -hmm. their family unit staying together, or when a child comes into the foster care system and they need a safe place to land, mm -hmm. or when kids are going through their parents experiencing divorce and they just need some sense of calm or they need a mentor, mm -hmm. a positive role model in their life that they can process some of their feelings with mm -hmm. as they bounce back from dad's house to mom's house. Mm -hmm. Those are things that invest in this next generation that's going to change our community. It's going to change the way we view commitments. Mm. It's going to change just really kind of the fabric of life for other people. Mm. And so I've always wanted, whether it's my career or how I spend my time outside of work, I've always wanted that to be helping others. And so in some respects, it's just a continuum of that. I was helping mm -hmm. people rehab from surgeries and car accidents mm -hmm. and injuries. And now I'm mm -hmm. helping people restore and repair broken relationships or understand how trauma has impacted their brains or their behavior. Mm -hmm. um, it looks very different in playing it out. It looks very different to go to the to work at my physical therapy clinic than it does to come to work here at the Alliance. But at the same thing, I, I feel like the foundation of getting to help others, to make our community better, and to bring healing has mm -hmm. been continuous throughout my career. I love that. It got me thinking of a personal example. My husband and I are in uh, empty nests, as we talked about in we were very invested in our kids for 20 plus years. And then all of a sudden, poof, you know, and yeah. it happened in um, August of this year. And I, Darren and I decided, Hey, let's, we're going on 30 years of marriage. Let's, let's go back and get some counseling. Our pact with each other was always to get counseling every five to six years, just because we wanted a good marriage. And sometimes we're like, Oh, I only needed a couple sessions to give each other a high five and move on. But we're in this place of, we want more clarity of where we're going. And so yeah. we moved back into counseling. One of the things that's hitting us the most and where we're getting a lot of clarity is the impact of, of attachment. And my counselor's words are ringing through my head of everything is always about attachment. Yes. She said that statement to us just recently. And dear, Darren and I keep repeating that. We're like, everything is about attachment. Like, what does that mean? And yes. we're getting more and more clarity around this, but it makes me think of our sweet foster kids and adopted kids. And what, what are we doing? And what are you, what are we doing to really address what happens with that attachment being broken? Can you speak to that a little bit? I can. That attachment is so foundational. And for all of you listening, we're just, I want to define that. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, as we're born into the world, we're looking to, for, to our primary caregiver to meet all of our needs. And so attachment mm -hmm. is primarily built between the ages of zero and two. Um, babies have needs and then they cry. 
And mm -hmm. then the attachment is actually built when a care, a loving caregiver comes and figures out, are you hungry? Do you need a diaper change? Are you sleepy? Do you just want me to pick you up? And as that attachment of meeting of needs, voicing a need, having it met, that's building trust. And mm. the currency of attachment is trust. Mm. Um, we then grow up. And if we're around safe, loving teachers and mentors and sports coaches and friends, we continue to be a very trusting person. We continue to operate in the best version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, in the attachment um, studies, there's the securely attached person. Mm -hmm. That's the person, or you can earn secure. If you had insecure mm -hmm. attachment, and there's several different forms of insecure attachment, mm -hmm. but if you had that growing up, you can earn secure later by going through counseling, by learning to trust, mm -hmm. by learning to voice your needs. Um, so often when needs go unmet, and this is in little kids, toddlers, teenagers, mm -hmm. and all of us as adults, even in marriage or in work relationships, if we're voicing needs and our needs go unmet long enough, we either get angry or we stop talking altogether. We stop mm -hmm. voicing our needs, but then mistrust forms. If mm -hmm. we have that, we're not going to be great on a team at work. Mm -hmm. We're going to predict that People are not going to meet our needs. We're not mm -hmm. even going to necessarily say what they are, or we're going to get frustrated and have very low expectations. We're going to, mm -hmm. we're going to operate out of this scarcity mindset that nobody's there to help me. I'm not going to get my needs met. I better just do it myself. And I'm going to have a chip on my shoulder mm -hmm. in that environment, whether it's home or work as mm -hmm. adults. And so a lot of times trauma work or counseling or mm. marriage and family therapy is all about learning how to trust again, to voice mm. your needs, um, whether it's on your team at work, whether mm. it's in your marriage or in your relationship with friends, we can say, Hey, this mm. is how I'm experiencing you, or this is how I'm experiencing this situation. Here's what I need. Mm. It's also learning what's our half, right? Mm. In all relationships, we do what we're responsible for. We're not responsible. It's not taking responsibility of how people respond to us. Mm -hmm. Um, so just because you didn't have a loving caregiver doesn't mean you weren't worth love and attention and their yes, it didn't mm -hmm. mean that it just mm -hmm. meant that they weren't capable of, of meeting your needs. Mm -hmm. Um, and so a lot of things boil down to attachment and we live in a culture of mistrust and broken attachment. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I love how you unpack that. Thank you, Tiffany. And I think that's where. I think that's where we can grow our clarity as we look at where our attachment levels are. And I know there's anxious attachment, ambiguous attachment, uh, secure attachment, avoidant attachment. Yeah. I'm learning a lot about all this. It's fascinating. You are. To me. Yes, Good. I am. And I love it. And I've too worked with at-risk kids and I saw that. I like that you talked about the currency of attachment is trust because that's what I saw was their lack of trust. And I realized you have to earn it. And that part of that comes from being a safe attachment or a safe adult that says, yes. when you ask for something, I will listen to you. I will see you. I will value you. And I will hear you, which is what yep. grows the trust, which grows the attachment. Um, and translating that onto teams is also the ability to give and receive feedback. Right. Right. We have a, con we have conversations about that at, on my team regularly. Mm -hmm. I like feedback. I want, yeah. I want my whole team to know as a leader, I want your feedback what mm. the feedback as an organization, also your feedback for me, like mm. I give them full permission to come and tell me, Hey, here's how I'm experiencing you mm. as a leader or in this situation or, you know, good, bad. Hey, I'd, I'd like to have a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And so I actually really appreciate all forms of feedback. Mm. Um, and so, especially when people can give it to you in a constructive way with clarity, then that's really, really helpful for us as leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Um, I think every leader deserves to lead with clarity. So what would you say to any of our listeners out there who might be struggling with getting their clarity? I would say my two top tips are to, to do what you said at the beginning. We have to step away from the grind. We have to step away from our inbox. We have to mm -hmm. step away from our staff meetings and our agendas long enough to gain clarity and to triage our environment. Mm -hmm. And for each one of us, it looks different because we're managing different amounts of work. We're working on different projects. We have different strengths on our teams. We're working in different industries. Mm -hmm. When that happens, 
um, where we don't have clarity, when we recognize, hey, I'm struggling because I can't put into words what I'm supposed to be doing or what I want to convey to my team. Casting vision as a leader is a huge skill set mm-hmm. that we sometimes come naturally to the table with. Sometimes we don't, but it's needed in mm-hmm. every leadership position. You have to be able to cast vision for the people on your team. Mm-hmm. Some people who are fast processors can do that in an instant. Others who need time really need that step away. Let me take a day. Let me take an afternoon. Blocking Mm -hmm. off your calendar, turning, silencing your Mm -hmm. notifications on your phone, not opening your inbox at all Mm -hmm. for that day or that Mm -hmm. afternoon so that you aren't pull. Your mental pull is not already on 10 tasks that you haven't done, but it's on looking at the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. We talk about this in collaboration often with the Alliance because we work with over 60 local organizations and mm-hmm. we want them to know what their piece of the puzzle is and we mm-hmm. want them to actually see the bigger picture. But each one of them carries a fantastic mission, vision and set of values and things that they're doing in the community. I need them to stay 95 percent focused on their mission, their programs, their resources. Mm-hmm. I only want to ask for a 5 percent of their time and energy to stop and look around and see the bigger picture, to attend an event so they could collaborate with other organizational leaders, to um, hop on a Zoom meeting where we're doing a think tank, to attend um, Mm. a a training, a Mm. leadership training um, where they become better leaders. I Mm. I can't walk in and assume I can ask for a whole bunch of their time because that would actually take them away from their mission. Mm -hmm. I just want every every now and again for them to look around and Mm -hmm. see what else is happening happening in our region and how they play, uh, how, like how their organization or their mission mm-hmm. plays into that. But we can do that as people too. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, what's most urgent and what's most important for us isn't the same as what's mm-hmm. most urgent and important for the rest of our team. Mm-hmm. So stepping back, casting vision, and then understanding where that falls and the scheme of how your organization operates. Mm, the big picture. I love that. I think it can be counterintuitive. I'm going to just say this out loud for all of us, all my fingers pointing back, (laughs) but all my listeners who are really high achievers and high activists. Sometimes when we're not sure on our clarity, our temptation is to stay in the game, grind harder, work harder, do more, stay on the hamster wheel. It feels counterintuitive. And again, I'm pointing all my fingers back at me. It feels counterintuitive sometimes to say, I... I'm struggling with clarity of what's next or prioritizing the tyranny of the urgent, so to speak. I'm going to step back, take a walk. In my book, I talk about daily uh, pulling away, weekly pulling away, monthly pulling away, and annual pulling away. But I do think it's a system for how we step back. And daily having that pullback, uh, weekly having some time, whether it's a half a day or full day, and then monthly having a weekend or an overnight or something to get your clarity and then uh, annual having a full week to pull back and take care of you. Yeah. I guess I want to ask you about the daily. And as we wrap up here, I don't even ask you if I'm just going to make the assumption because what I've learned in working with leaders is every leader has some way of how they wake up and start their day, what I'm calling morning rituals. Yeah. So I'm not even going to ask you if you do it. I'm assuming you do do it. I do. And I want to ask you about it. What do you do and share with our listeners? How do you start your day? What's some of your morning rituals? I'm thankful that I'm a morning person and no one else in my family is. So it does leave oh. me with a quiet house for the first hour of the day. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and so I, it is my quiet time. Yeah. Um, there's definitely time to read. There's time to pray. There's time to reflect on the day ahead. There's time to prepare my heart and my mind for everything that I'm going to do. Um, I'm with my pets cause I'm also a pet person. So my quiet time also involves like the dog and the cat on top of me. And so there's oh, like I that love it. physical snuggle time, which yeah. is like so life giving, but I, if I don't have that time to mm-hmm. sit and slow down, like to, to slowly enter my day, mm-hmm. to slowly process through what's in my heart, what's in my mind, what's on my agenda, I will miss something. Mm. I will miss opportunities or I will miss people because I'm really pushing towards a project deadline or a task. Mm. Um, And so having that special quiet time in the morning with a quiet house, 
Um, right now it's really um, just nice because it's darker still. So it's mm. almost like there's this progression of mm. into the day because by the end of it, the sun's come up. And so I'm ready to start my day. Mm. Um, but my morning routine is definitely sitting in my favorite spot in the living room with my books um, and the pets and a cup of coffee. That was very similar to my morning as well. I hear you. And I've got dogs who look forward to my morning time probably more than I do. <laughs> Mom's up. <laughs> I love it. Well, as we sign off here, uh, what encouragement can you give some of our listeners? One of the things that I've I've realized in the work that I do is I meet people a lot at the crossroads. That's what coaching does is people are, are looking at different opportunities in their life. It may not be as dramatic as leaving healthcare like you did and moving into it and starting a whole new nonprofit. It could be more of like starting a hobby or choosing a different yeah. relationship or or anything else along those lines. But I want to say, what encouragement would you give them to really get that clarity about what they want to do, the confidence around their beliefs around it, and really the courage to take action steps forward in it? What encouragement would you give them? We have a phrase here at the Alliance of being a difference maker. And I feel like if we wake up on a daily basis, knowing that we have the opportunity and the invitation to make a difference for other people, whether they're in your family, on your, you know, on your workforce team or in the community, when we're empowered with that phrase, I'm a difference maker. I'm going to, I'm going to make a difference for people today. I'm going to show up for people today. I feel like that invitation to us as leaders, to us as, um, maybe bosses or staff members to us as family members, then we're going to show up as our best form of ourself. Mm. Um, I love that there's this interplay of purpose. Like we're all looking to have purpose in life Mm. and we get to blend that with what we do at work and what we do at home and who we are in the community. Um, And when we do that, we're definitely making a difference for other people. I love it. It reminds me of a Another personal example that I will put on the table because I think our listeners will love this. Need to Breathe is one of my favorite music groups and they have a song called Difference Maker. And one year for Christmas, my kids are trying to figure out what to get me. And I said, I would like each of you to gift me a song and tell me why you like this song for me. And my daughter gave me the song Difference Maker by Need to yes. Breathe. And that I is just, a good song. yeah, and I love the fact, I'll never forget, it's one of my favorite gifts. I'll never forget that that's, that's how she sees me. Oh my goodness. I can, I could die in peace now <laughs> right. that my daughter has seen me as a difference maker. And, and I want to say, I don't think it's as hard as you think it is. It's right. really listening to your gut. I think that's the encouragement I want to say is it's listening to your gut. It's listening to your instinct. It's listening to your higher power. It's listening to something beyond yourself that says, I think I'm made for more. And yes. I think that's encouraging I want to leave with our listeners is we believe, Tiffany and I both believe for you and with you that you get to go after the life that you're truly made for. And you get to have yes. all the clarity and the confidence you need and the courage in abundance and in spades. Because if you don't show up for your life, there will be a hole in this world that will be less of a world. And we need you showing up for your life. And so we are cheering you on. And Tiffany, it's such a pleasure to have you on my show today. And honestly, it's a it's a pleasure to be partnering with you as you you're a difference maker out there in the world. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And this has just been such a great and inspiring conversation. I'm encouraged. Good. Thanks, Tiffany. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'd love a review. Helps us out quite a bit. Wherever you are, just drop a review and you can find out more at heatherpenny.com. Cheering you on.